Hi, my name is Jay. How are you, everyone? Cool. Uh, so this is going to be a very quick talk, uh, hopefully very quick, about WebGL. And this is really um, a very deep dive. So I want to discuss things more toward the hardware level rather than the JavaScript level. However, being a JavaScript conference, we will do some JavaScript. So let's begin. Um, so this is me. Uh, my name is Jay, again. Uh, that's my Twitter. You can tweet about this, do whatever you want with it. Uh, I work for PubNub as a core engineer, so I do server level stuff, uh, Python, a little bit of C. I contribute to Melon.js, which is a game engine written in JavaScript. It uses WebGL very recently, which I, uh, I contributed over uh, last winter, I believe. Uh, and what I want to really start with here is a little bit of the history of GPUs and uh, rendering hardware. And we'll show some fun stuff with that and then go through and get into what WebGL actually is. Um, uh, WebGL proper, rather. So on the last slide, you noticed I said console hacking. This is Mario 64, uh, Nintendo 64. This is a hack that I made. And it uh, has nothing to do with WebGL except, you know, this is the kind of low-level stuff that I get into. This, for example, was written in MIPS assembler language, and that's what it looks like. Uh, you can go through it if you want. Um, very simple, the comments, just read them out loud. They're awesome. Uh, so what it really does is changes the liquid to a solid by checking your position. Once your feet touch the water, uh, moves the level, the ground level, up to where your feet are. That's it. Um, very interesting. And uh, you can see even more of that in some old stuff like, say, the Atari 2600. Uh, what I mean by that is, to really program anything on this old hardware, especially when uh, you get into rendering stuff on a screen, you're really messing with the hardware. Uh, so this thing has a tiny CPU. Uh, it's about one megahertz. Uh, not very many pixels can be displayed. 128 colors roughly on screen simultaneously. It has 128 bytes of RAM. That includes all of your stack space and game state, which is roughly enough for a couple of counters and a ball position. Uh, interestingly enough, no video memory. So what the heck? How did they actually do anything with this at all? Um, it turns out that there's a a really great presentation at a GDC a couple of years ago by David Crane, who was the author of the original Pitfall. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but do check this out. And I'll tweet out the slides later so you can check out the video. Uh, it goes into a lot of depth about how Really, with this hardware, you have to think in terms of hardware rather than in terms of software. And that's kind of what I want to bring out in this presentation about WebGL, is it's the same idea. Uh, it's not that we're really writing, in WebGL, we're not really writing code for 3D rendering so much as we are writing code that pokes a bunch of bits into buffers and then asks the GPU to do funny things with with custom code. So this is really awesome, and I do recommend checking it out. Now, going forward a few years, uh, one of the very first arcade games that contained 3D rendering hardware was the Namco System 21, released in 1988. It has a little bit faster CPU. It has five DSPs. Those are digital signal processors, which do all of the 3D mathematics. It also has 12 custom integrated circuits, which are all of the components necessary for the rendering. So this thing has roughly 17 GPUs. Uh, it, it has a little bit of memory, uh, lots of video RAM. It needs that for drawing those uh, garage shaded 3D artifacts. And on the farther range in the mid 90s, Nintendo came out with the 
Nintendo 64, and we saw that screenshot earlier. This thing has a 93 megahertz CPU. It's a MIP CPU. It also has a GPU that is roughly 62 megahertz, also a MIPS CPU, and this is very important because it's programmable. This is one of the very first uh, instances in, uh, in gaming consoles, at least, uh, gaming console hardware where the GPU is programmable. In its contemporaries, like with PlayStation and so forth, they gave you really a piece of hardware, a, a processor that's really designed for doing one thing, and that's like drawing triangles or, or whatever. In the case of Nintendo, though, they had a, a program that you could load onto this GPU and have it run, and then it just uses message passing between your main CPU and your GPU, and you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. Unfortunately, very few companies ever did, so they just used the, the standard stuff that SGI shipped. And this is kind of what it looked like, at least for the PlayStation era of 3D rendering. Uh, the top portion is the CPU, the bottom portion in green is the GPU. So if your game program wants to draw something, uh, draw something pretty, it might say, you know, I want to draw a rectangle. So it, it builds up this packet and then it puts this on a queue. And the GPU is constantly consuming from this queue and it says, oh, well, I've got a rectangle. This one's going to be blue. And then it passes that information on to a rasterizer. And the rasterizer is part of the fixed functionality pipeline. So in this case, it has a rectangle, goes to the re rectangle rasterizer. We also do triangles, all kinds of different primitives. Uh, some examples might be, say, textured or gorod shaded uh, different forms of lighting, so on. And uh, so things, uh, uh, one interesting thing to note about this is those little boxes in red, those rasterizers, that's where this programmable part of the GPU comes in. So on N64, you could change those. You could do things like, uh, do special lighting or whatever you needed to, to do. And this is really what kind of leads into the more modern, uh, more modern GPU and how it actually works. Uh, in this case, how the pipeline is, or uh, simplified anyway, uh, closer to it. When your CPU wants to draw something, it creates a big binary blob. It's completely opaque, arbitrary, doesn't really mean anything to the GPU. You put it into a buffer, so you create a bunch of buffer slots in memory, you shove some data in there, and then you ask the GPU when you're ready to start drawing using these buffers. And what happens is this blob is passed on to the vertex shader, which is part of the, this programmable pipeline, and the vertex shader will then pass information onto the fragment shader. And we'll see some some more stuff about that in a bit. Um, now getting into actual WebGL stuff, these are some really good resources that you can use to learn about it. Uh, the top there, WebGL Fundamentals, is awesome. It was written by uh, a guy whose first name is Greg. He was a, a programmer on the Chrome team. Uh, really cool guy. And what he wants to do with this website is build some fresh tutorials and, you know, real information that isn't just rehashed from old stuff that came out of, like, you know, OpenGL 1.0, 2.0 tutorials. And uh, the MSDN WebGL reference is really awesome, so if there are any Microsoft guys here, props to that. This is actually the best reference that I've been able to find for the WebGL API itself. Uh, Kronos is the... The group that oversees the WebGL specification, uh, they have a wiki, and there's some awesome presentations from Google I.O. that talk a little bit more in detail about WebGL itself and how you uh, build the buffers, modify uh, attributes, and so forth. Uh, so do watch those. And uh, read the specifications if you're really desperate. They contain actual information, but they're 
uh, very dense, hard to read, and avoid at all costs those retrofitted OpenGL stuff. Uh, a lot of that information is just not portable. Uh, so, the very first steps, first thing we can do uh, to get our WebGL project going, we have some DOM elements. We start out with a canvas, and we have a script. And this is their JavaScript. In my example here, I'm using jQuery just because it makes it easy to select that screen element and get the WebGL context. There's also a little helper function here, which I use just for uh, reusability, really. What it does is it creates a shader object. Then the shader source code is uploaded into that object or passed into that object. Finally, it's compiled. And then this compiled object is returned. The next thing to do is actually take your shader source code and you'll notice this is, these are just strings. Uh, they can be anything, really. Source your source code from anything. For example, a, uh, a text file on a server, you just load it in with XHR. Uh, I've also seen in some tutorials they use a script tag for this purpose. Um, it doesn't really matter. We're just using a string here. And. Something funny about these shaders is they're really the bare minimum that you need. It, it looks, it's a C-like language, and it has a couple of global variables, these GL underscore things. Uh, these are global variables, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so here we go. We create a program object. We attach our our shader source code that we get from our get shader function, attach that to the, to the program, attach the second one to the program, and then we link it. And again, this is like compiler stuff. So we compile them, compile, link, and then we have this use program. And the use program is very interesting because it means that you can actually have multiple shaders running or rather multiple shaders loaded simultaneously, and then just switch between them when you need to do different things. So you might have one that's a quad shader, and it draws textured triangles, textured whatever. And then you might want to switch over to a line shader, which does uh, like wireframe stuff, rather. Uh, another example would be uh, deferred lighting. Uh, different tricks that you can pull off, but you just use different programs and switch between them per frame. You don't want to do it too often, but uh, it, it's available for flexibility. And before we go on with any more code, uh, this is where the shaders w will be kind of demystified. There are two parts uh, that are programmable, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. And you can read about uh, kind of their purpose here. Uh, the one in the middle is the rasterizer, and this is part of the fixed functionality pipeline. This is something that you don't have to code. It's just built into WebGL, and it does stuff for you. In this case, the rasterizer will take information that it gets from the vertex shader, the code that you write, and does some interpolation on it and then passes that information on to the fragment shader, which is more code that you write. So you can use these two programmable things to do some, uh, well, to do some very basic things like the textured quads, so on and so forth. But you can also do very interesting effects, which uh, I didn't have time to write, but do some crazy transitions and wobbly stuff, and it's just fun. So the uh, things that you pass from JavaScript into these shaders are things like attributes and uniform variables and so forth. So just what is a uniform variable? Uh, Uniform variable is a part of the GL shader language, which is called a data storage type quantifier. <coughs> and there are three of these, attribute, uniform, and varying. In this diagram, I have 
on the, the left side, JavaScript, you're able to provide attributes and uniform variables directly to your shaders. In the case of uniform, you can pass uniforms directly to both shaders simultaneously and attributes only to the vertex shader. The difference between these two things is kind of subtle, uh, especially for beginners. The attribute itself is technically treated as an array within WebGL, which means that you would normally want to pass things like your geometry using, using attributes. You would want to pass things like uh, the, the blending color of a specific triangle, things of that nature. A uniform, on the other hand, is something that is very static. Once you set a uniform variable and ask WebGL to draw your, your attribute array, uh, that uniform can't change. So it's really static. And this is good for things like global blend colors and ambient lighting, uh, a projection matrix if you're doing 3D. And also on the left side, we have some actual GLSL code. Uh, this is just variable declarations, but it also has some data type information here. The attributes, for example, have VEC4, which are four element vectors. In the case of the color, that's RGB and alpha, those four elements. In the case of position, it's X, Y, Z, and a W. The W is a scalar. This is called homogeneous coordinates. Uh, I know I said I wouldn't get into any mathematics. Uh, this is about as mathy as it gets. Uh, really, I just want to explain what the hardware is doing so you can poke at it and do funny things. Um, what else can I talk about here? The, uh, uh, the texture coordinate is a, is a two element vector, uh, so on and so forth. And these are the GL underscore global variables that you saw earlier in the minimal vertex and fragment shaders. So the shader language itself specifies these variables. And it's kind of weird they didn't use something like, I don't know, a return value from the main function or inputs to the main function, whatever. I don't know. But you get four different outputs that you can, you can write to. So there's a position output from your, your uh, vertex shader, which allows you to do things like input a vertex from JavaScript, do something with it. Maybe you want to... Uh, cause it to wobble, so a tree or grass wobbling in the wind, something of that sort. And then you can set the value of that position, which then just gets updated by the vertex shader. And the vertex shader will run once per vertex element. So if you have a triangle that runs three times, one for each point. Um, let's see, what else? The frag color is for the fragment shader. And that just specifies the color that you want to draw to the frame buffer eventually. The frag data is for multiple render targets, which you can use for some really crazy uh, lighting effects and so forth. Uh, it's part of the fixed functionality pipeline. I haven't played with it too much, but it's there. It's available. GL point size and point coord are inputs, which allow you to, uh, sorry, the point coord is an input. Um, the point size is an output. So you would output a, a size of a point, so you can make a, a point that's like this big or really tiny. And the point coord tells you where in the rasterizer that actually is drawing. So where it's drawing your point. You can use this for funny, uh, for some interesting things like, say, radial gradients, right? Um, this is going back to some JavaScript. And this is where WebGL itself gets kind of mind-boggling because it's it's really a very simple API when you get down to it. 
However, it's like nothing that resembles other web technologies whatsoever, uh, really because it comes out of the OpenGL world. So you have to do things like bind your data to the GPU so you can perform I.O. operations on it. Totally weird. This is JavaScript shouldn't do this, but this is what we have. In the first case, we have an attribute, which again is is it it's an array, right? So what we can do is specify how WebGL is supposed to chop up this data, this big binary blob, and make sense of it as an array. Uh, we have this A position here on the right, the string is the variable name from our, our vertex shader. And you can do some uh, some more interesting things with your JavaScript, for example, parsing your source code to pull out all of the variable names and so forth to do this automatically. But for a simple demo, this is this is okay. So we need a uh, we need to get the location according to the GPU of where that variable exists somewhere in memory. So that's get attribute location. Second thing is we can enable it. And I'm not entirely certain of the purpose behind this, but you can enable and disable these attribute arrays as you see fit. Uh, it's disabled by default, so do enable it if you want to use it. And the third line there will do the actual chopping up of this binary blob into usable array elements. In this case, the uh, the arguments to this function are first the bound variable, second the component size. In this case, the a position is a four a vec four, so it's it has a component size for four components. The type is either going to be float, a floating point number, or fixed, which is a fixed point number. And the next is whether or not this data is normalized. I've never had a use for normalized data in my attribute array, so I don't use it. The next thing is the stride or the size of each element in bytes. In the case of this VEC4, it's 32 bytes. That is four elements times four bytes. And finally, the byte offset. The byte offset is, allows you to combine multiple variables into, the, into a single array. So you might have, for example, this position attribute. You might also have a blend color following it. So in that case, you would have an offset of 0 for the position and an offset of 32, which is just following the, uh, the position for that blend color. And you can do uh, some additional things here. Uh, it's probably a little bit easier with some graphics but uh, I will just go through this uh, as, quick as, as quick as I can because it's kind of boring. The, uh, the uniforms are very similar. You have to get the location, uh, but you don't have to specify anything else about it. It's already a known, uh, a known data type. So you can simply populate it directly, and we can do that by creating a float32 array and just fill out the information, whatever you want, in your projection matrix. Uh, I just have commented out there, uh, we don't care what these values are at the moment. And that last line is how to actually populate this uniform. There are a whole bunch of different functions that you can use for WebGL. They all start with uniform. So there's, a, there's one for a matrix 4, there's one for a matrix 3, matrix 2, vector 4, vector 3, all these different functions. So it, it's not a, uh, an awesome thing uh, to have to learn, but uh, there are multiple functions for uh, one for each data type. And the next thing we can do is populate the attribute buffer that we created, or populate the attribute with a buffer. We want to create the buffer and bind the buffer to this array underscore buffer index. This is a, 
It's an index to a register within WebGL. So rather than passing around full objects to WebGL, what you're really doing is passing around these indexes. It's kind of like a pointer. Uh, it's smaller, it's more compact, and uh, really, yeah, it, it's just for performance reasons, I, I imagine. Uh, bind the buffer to this register and then actually fill out the buffer. So the buffer data method contains at least two forms, possibly more. That second element is either a size for the array, uh, for the buffer, or it's going to be a reference to a float32 array or some kind of other native data type. So in the first one, we're just creating it and giving it a size and say, oh, okay, well, I have, uh, each element is 32 bytes long and I have three of those elements, so that's the size of it. In the bottom portion, we create a, an array of vertices and these are, again, four element vectors, x, y, z, and w. And this creates a simple triangle. Right now I'm just using, uh, what is it called, normalized, uh, normalized coordinates, uh, unit coordinates, uh, unit, unit vectors, sorry. So unit vectors uh, between uh, zero and one, or in this case, negative one to one. And we take this array and we set the, uh, send that to the buffer through the buffer data. The shader for this is starting to get a little bit more complex. Now we have a uniform matrix and an attribute for our position. Uh, the position being the position of each vector, or uh, each vertex of the triangle itself. And then finally we have a varying variable. And as you recall from a previous slide, the varying variables always get passed from the vertex shader into the fragment shader. Uh, we don't touch those from JavaScript otherwise. Inside the main function, uh, this vertex shader will receive the position and the matrix from our attribute and our uniform and runs the main function uh, against each of those elements within our array. And in this case, we're going to set the color for the varying. In this case, it's red. Uh, the, the vec4 there is RGB and A. And we're going to set the position, which is going to be our matrix multiplied by the position, the actual vertex. So this would allow us to do things like project it into three dimensions. And on the other end, the fragment shader receives the vec, the vec4 color from the vertex shader, and it simply just passes it right back to the rasterizer for uh, drawing that color to the actual location. And uh, really, that's all I have for you. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I kind of went through that really rapidly. Um, one thing that I can comment, though, is there's a website called shadertoy.com, and if you're interested in getting into WebGL and shaders and so forth, definitely check out ShaderToy. Uh, they have a lot of really cool demos, but it also has a, uh, a, a sandbox, a GLSL sandbox that you can just type in your, your own shader language and run it right there. Um, pretty cool stuff. So since I do have uh, about 10 minutes, I'm uh, more than happy to take some questions if anyone has any. Great question. So the question is if you want to start a big project, medium project, whether you want to use a framework to help or uh, just learn WebGL itself. Personally, I would recommend if you're short on time, use the framework. Use 3JS, use, uh, I don't know, there are a whole bunch of them. Um, but it will really uh, get you up and running rapidly. 
And if you don't need to use anything very special, like you're not uh, going to cause, I don't know, ripple effects and wobbling and wonky stuff, uh, you don't necessarily need to do like actual coding shader stuff, yeah. right? You just might want to just load a model, uh, make sure it rotates around, do that sort of thing. The frameworks are awesome for that. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Uh, shaders with 3 js yeah. Yes, it's possible. Yep. They have some kind of uh, some kind of functionality for that. Yeah. Right, because 3 js was incredibly easy compared to just doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, WebGL itself is kind of intense, to be honest. Uh, it, uh, like I said, it's like nothing we've ever seen before or since on JavaScript or on the web platform. Specifically because it's so low level, right? Yeah. Good question. The GLSL itself is a specification for, uh, I believe it came out with OpenGL ES. Not entirely certain about that. ES is for embedded system, which is for like tablets and phones, mobile devices. So it's a cut down version of OpenGL. And the, the shader language itself is for writing the programmable part of this uh, rendering pipeline. So it's a C-like language. It's its own language entirely. Okay. And you compile it down into, a, uh, into what's a, essentially a, a machine code. And you do that from the browser. From the browser, yeah. So uh, let me go back a couple of slides, and we'll find that example. Uh, uh, right there. So when we create the shader here, yeah. and then we say compile shader, this shader variable is just a string. It's just a big, who cares what it is? It's a, a string of source code. And we ask WebGL API itself to compile that. So it compiles it down into uh, an object file, right? executable, half executable. And then eventually, you ask it to link. So once you have all your shaders up, you link them together, and then you use the program. So that's kind of how uh, the shader language fits in with WebGL, the API. OK. And then uh, what do you use uh, WebGL for instead of just using something like 3JS? Like, what prime your projects? Ah, so. I don't recall exactly which framework I was using originally with MelonJS. Yeah. Uh, it was whatever. It was using Browserify and some other things. Uh, what I found, though, is it turned out to be really too slow for some very particular use case. Uh, for MelonJS, it's just a 2D rendering uh, game engine. So we don't need things like you know, 3D projection and all this fancy stuff. Uh, we just need to draw a bunch of triangles really quickly. And so that's kind of why I started learning all this stuff. And eventually, uh, I was able to write this little compositor that's actually a lot faster than what we attempted to prototype to begin with. Uh, so that was the, the primary reason for, for going through all this hassle. Yeah. Yes? Fragment shader coding techniques. Uh, a lot of the information is just whatever you can find on Google. You can also, yeah, you can also check out Shader Toy because they give you all kinds of different demos. You just go find one that you're interested in and look through the source code. But because it's shader language and you may not be familiar with anything similar to it, uh, I would really recommend just you know, taking it one step at a time, look at some very simple examples, and then go on to the, the more interesting things, the, more, the things that you're more interested in. Oh, image processing. Well, that's what I mean by fragment shaders, math, Yeah, yeah, that's. So just seeing tutorials here and there, it doesn't really give you the foundation. True. If you wanted to go for the foundation, There's a library called, um, I don't recall what it's called. Uh, it has a really funny name. Uh, maybe I can find it here. 
the uh, yeah, I would just really look at um, graphics gems as a as a really good one. So things like uh, I don't know, SGI has their conference SIGGRAPH, right? And they always have white papers coming out of that and uh, different presentations that you can watch about different uh, rendering techniques. Um, presentations, presentations, white papers. Okay. Definitely check out white papers if you're interested in that stuff. Um, one example, solid example I can give you is how to do font rendering within WebGL. Because we're just doing things like uh, abstract points within WebGL itself, rather than uh, rasterizing, uh, vectorizing a, right, a, a glyph or something, an S, say. Uh, there are some really interesting techniques for using uh, a, a mask, so you can, like, uh, how, how did it work? It was like, you create Bezier curves and uh, get those to rasterize and then use masks and so forth. And you can actually do like a, a vector font uh, with, within WebGL itself. But this was all information that came out of a white paper. So, yeah. I remember like this term in web. Materials are a much more higher level concept. This is something that you'd more find in a framework like 3JS. Yeah. So what could you describe? What what does material do? Uh, material uh, would be something like add reflectivity uh, or um, uh, what's another example? Uh, gloss, glow, you know, that sort of thing. So you can create a, create a mirror in your world or create um, reflections on the body of a car, you know, stuff like that. So surface aspects. Uh, yeah, it, precisely. Surface of any given material and what its qualities are. Precisely, yeah. Uh, but it's a more higher level concept than what you would do uh, with like this abstract points and such. Within a fragment shader, if you were to write a fragment shader for doing reflections and so forth, then you would want to do, uh, well, you would build that yourself clearly, but it would be things like, uh, I don't know, reflect this vertex and then uh, do some ray casting or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So it can get complex, but yeah. What are your thoughts on security in WebGL? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you can do some really bad things if you're not careful. For example, spin your fragment shader out of control with a, an uncontrollable loop, just as an example. <laughs> Excuse me. The, uh, yeah, in that case, uh, Chrome, I know, will support some uh, minimal sandboxing for you. And it actually has this concept of losing the WebGL context, in part because of this aspect. And in the case that the WebGL context gets lost, then you have to recreate it and reinitialize all the stuff. But uh, it allows you to, say, have multiple WebGL renders running, running, running simultaneously, whether they're within the same browser tab or within your own. And they can be killed individually and so forth. Uh, yeah, really the worst as far as security goes is a den denial of service, and those are some of the techniques to, to take care of that. Yeah? All myself. For uh, which parts exactly? Let's say for a game or something pretty intense. Uh, I mean, like, which, uh, which features? Um, oh, uh, I don't have a feature in mind. It's okay. like wondering what's the cost of you know, nice, having a nice ivory as opposed to getting my hand dirty. Um, I think there's a very minimal trade-off, to be honest. Like, there may be a slight performance cost, probably not all that, probably doesn't matter all that much. But really, the, the trade-off, I think, would be in terms of flexibility, like what you're able to, to do. If you had something very specific in mind, like you can actually build an entire game and run it within the GPU and not touch JavaScript at all, except for poking at it every now and again, say, hey, update the frame, update the frame, update the frame. 
Um, so if you wanted to do something very specialized like that, uh, a framework won't help you. Um, but again, that code isn't really use reusable, so you know it's going to be a one-off thing. The framework is really meant to be reusable and run everywhere. Uh, yeah, one more. We have one more question. Uh, my opinion on Unity. I haven't used Unity. However, I know it has a huge community behind it, and community support is key. So if you are interested in getting into game development, Unity was probably a really good place to start. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone.